This video is a review for Remnant 2, and in order to review Remnant 2, I gotta talk about what I don't like about Elden Ring first. And that is the co-op. The co-op in Elden Ring, and really all of the Souls games, is very bad. There's lots of reasons for this, some of them are design choices, but the part that bothers me the most is that it's bad because it's poorly balanced. Levels and the specific enemy encounters in those levels aren't tuned to two people, they're tuned for one person. You can have a second player or a third player there, and the game will cope with that, it's still an enjoyable experience, but it radically shifts the dynamic. The increased health of enemies and bosses is not a sufficient adjustment, and you can tell that From Software also thinks that because they outsource balance to other players. In Elden Ring, when you participate in co-op, you also open yourself up to invasions. And there's no way around that. If you engage in one, you agree to engage in the other. Invasions are meant to offset the enormous advantages that a co-op player can have going through a level. From Software was moving in that direction for a while before Elden Ring. In Dark Souls 3, you were more likely to get invaded if you had phantoms. And in Bloodborne, you could only get invaded if you had a Bell Maiden active in your level. By default, these Bell Maidens weren't in most levels, they would spawn if you try to summon another player. It might not be the way invasions were initially envisioned, but that is what they eventually became. Invaders are a convenient and willing tool to throw at co-oping hosts and slow them down. They are a blunt and inelegant attempt at balance. But the real balance problem in Elden Ring is the bosses, because the bosses have no such tool. One of the main reasons people enjoy these games is the tempo of boss fights. For many, that's the biggest appeal. You fight the boss, you lose to the boss, you memorize or intuit its attack patterns, you figure out which openings are risky, which ones will let you do a couple of attacks, and which ones will let you be more greedy and how greedy you should be in those moments. You manage your stamina, you dodge, you block, you parry, and even finding a good opportunity to heal is part of this flow. This is what's often referred to as the dance. You know, it feels like you're dancing with the boss, everybody says that. And this dance is what is most impacted by the use of co-op. The bosses don't deal well with two targets, much less three. And that's because their move sense aren't necessarily designed for three people. They're designed so that one person experiences the dance. And if you're taking three people in, it's probably because you just want to get through it, not that you want to experience that dance. Now, I think what I just said is generally true. There are caveats. You can put as many caveats as you want in there. Not every boss is equally affected. Some of them have wide-ranging attacks that can be a challenge even if you have multiple people. Some of the bosses that consist of more than one boss seem like they reverse the trend in that they're more balanced if you fight them with two people rather than by yourself. You know, whatever caveats and exceptions you want to put in my generalization, I still think the generalization holds true. For the majority of bosses, the dance exists most prominently when you're fighting it by yourself, and that's because it's designed for one person. And the co-op is just a thing that's tacked on on top of that. And that's the reason why I usually don't engage in co-op multiplayer with my friends especially not on a first playthrough. It's because the rhythm of the boss design is something that I paid good money to experience, and it's something I'm willingly foregoing if I bring a buddy. And so I've always wanted from software to make a game with a different design approach. Souls games are primarily single player games that you can play in co-op. Which brings me at last to the focus of this review, Remnant 2. Remnant 2 is a third person shooter Souls-like that is extremely well balanced for co-op. It is not a single player game that you just tacked on co-op to, rather it seems more like a co-op game that you can also play by yourself. It's a game where the levels, the bosses, and the boss movesets are designed around the idea that you would be playing as a group. The bosses are perfectly capable of dealing with multiple targets at once, and they'll comfortably hand out game overs to a full party if you're not careful. So unlike most Souls games and Souls likes, playing with your friends doesn't mean foregoing big aspects of the boss design, it would mean that you're just participating in it. Now outside of just the co-op, 
Remnant 2 is still a great game in a lot of different ways, and we'll go over a lot of those ways in the review. But the co-op is what stands out the most. It does it a lot better than many of its peers. In fact, I would say if you're looking for a well-balanced, co-op-oriented game with a lot of Souls-like elements, then you can't do better than Remnant 2. So let's start with the obvious question, is Remnant 2 actually a Souls-like? Because there are obvious differences, and the fact that it focuses on ranged gun gameplay can call that into question. But it does also have a lot that is reminiscent from Souls games and was almost certainly inspired by Souls games to some degree. It has a bonfire-like checkpoint system. You'll have limited healing charges that you'll make use of throughout the level, and those charges won't get replenished until you find another checkpoint. The game does have a stamina bar to manage. You have a dodge roll that you can use to evade attacks or iframe through them. Your dodge roll is affected by the amount of armor that you're wearing, with different armor having different weights, and different weight classes will give you either a light, medium, or heavy roll. And many of the stronger enemies, especially the bosses, will have telegraphed attacks, and even sometimes telegraphed delayed melee attacks, that will make a Souls player feel right at home. And from what I can tell, the developers seem to think that it is. In an interview with the principal designer for Remnant 2, he says the following. We obviously get comparisons to Souls-type games a lot. Because we are Souls with guns. It's not like we hide from that. We don't say, like, oh no, that's not us. But I think we're also more than that in different ways. So it seems Remnant 2's staff is comfortable with the Souls-like moniker. So for ease of conversation, Souls-like is what I will call it for the rest of this video. Soon after the game begins, you'll have to pick between one of four classes, called Archetypes. Each Archetype starts at level 0, and as it gains experience and levels up through use, it will unlock up to three abilities and four passive perks. These abilities and perks will also improve as the class gets close to max level, which is level 10. Choosing an Archetype will also determine what your starting armor and weapons will be, and as a result how you'll initially play. The Hunter, for example, will start off with a bolt-action hunting rifle, and his class abilities and perks benefit most an accurate player who is consistently hitting weak spots. His abilities also mark targets, highlighting that enemy for both himself and other players, while also granting bonus crit chance against that enemy. The Challenger archetype starts off with heavy armor and a shotgun. His perks and abilities grant him more survivability, while also increasing his damage in melee and close-range combat. The Handler archetype starts with a dog companion. You can direct the dog to attack specific enemies, and the abilities are different howls that let your dog buff the entire party. The archetype has a lot of co-op utility. If a teammate is down, you can send the dog to revive him. And your passive perks give bonuses to your revive speed and your damage resistance while reviving other players. And finally, the Medic is a class built around healing allies whenever they need it. They also intrinsically buff an ally's ability to heal themselves. These four starting classes aren't the only ones in the game, there are 11 in total, and the rest can be unlocked through play. Once you unlock a new class, it is unlocked account-wide, and if you start a new game, you'll be able to start that game with that new class. Once unlocked, you'll be able to use any archetype and switch them out without cost. You're not trapped into any given playstyle. You can also equip two archetypes at once, one will be your primary archetype, and the other will be your secondary. Each archetype has access to three different abilities, but they can only equip to one of those three abilities at a time. The abilities are powerful, so once they're used, they'll go on a cooldown. By equipping a secondary archetype, you'll have access to two different abilities from two different archetypes, each one with a separate cooldown. You'll also benefit from the entirety of the passive perks that each archetype has unlocked. The primary and secondary archetypes that you choose will be the foundation of your build. The passive perks for each and the abilities that they use can synergize in interesting ways. For example, you can unlock later in the game a summoner archetype, and the passive perks that affect that class's summons also affect the dog companion from the handler class. And with 11 different archetypes, each one with three different abilities, 
you can mix and match them together until you find something that suits your preference. Now, the central premise of Remnant is that you are in a post-apocalyptic Earth. The world was destroyed by something called the Root, a hive mind, tree-like entity that is bent on destroying everything. There's also a magical crystal stone called the World Stone that connects to other universes. For reasons of the plot, you'll be traveling through the stone and exploring these different worlds. And these worlds are pretty diverse. A lush forest world in the process of being corrupted by the Root. An alien civilization trying to persist past the heat death of the universe. And then Yarnum. It's just... it's just Yarnum from Bloodborne. That one happens to be my favorite. Now when you start the game, there's a bit of procedural generation and a bit of randomness associated with your playthrough. Which world you'll start with is random. And each world has one of two quest lines. Which one you'll do is also random. Once you get into the world and begin exploring, you'll realize that there's actually quite a bit of area to explore. You won't know where to go at first. You do have a map, but that map doesn't get filled out until you go in that direction. And apart from the main path that continues the story and leads into new areas, there are also side dungeons that you could do. Now, I've mentioned the procedural generation, but it's not entirely procedurally generated. Random is often the better word. The way that it works is when you load into a new world, you might have the main path to go on and two side dungeons there as well. What dungeon is going to be through the side dungeon door is what's random. But the actual dungeons, the areas, are mostly the same. For example, you might cross through that door and get a dungeon called the Hatchery. Well, all the versions of the Hatchery that you might find have a similar layout and they have the same kind of enemies. And the boss that you fight in that dungeon will always be the same. But the layout and loot won't be exactly the same. Some of it is randomized. So if you go to your friend's world and he's doing the Hatchery and you're also doing the Hatchery, his version of the world might have loot and secrets that your world doesn't have on that role. Meaning that it could be worthwhile for you to do that dungeon again with your friend, even if you've done it yourself already. Now, I don't want to give a wrong impression. Not all the loot and locations are randomized. They're not all procedurally generated. Much of it is handcrafted and much of the loot is in the exact same places. Again, it's just that whether you see those places or not is what is random. Now, let me explain a little bit about combat. As you go through these environments, you will encounter enemies. When you engage these enemies, you might just need to kill the ones you see and move forward. However, as you progress, you will also trigger ambushes, in which a larger wave of enemies will spawn in after you. I actually think these ambushes could be a point of contention for Souls fans, since when this happens, the enemies could spawn even in rooms that you've cleared before, which might result in them attacking you from behind. I found this very annoying initially because one of the things I like to do when I play these types of games is really explore. And Remnant 2 has a lot of secret areas. And the loot that you can collect is pretty valuable. So I take my time when I explore. So having enemies spawn in rooms that you had cleared already, rooms that you thought were safe, was very irritating. But it's actually not that bad once you get used to it, because there's an audio cue that tells you when one of these ambushes is happening. And they don't happen all the time. They don't happen randomly they trigger around certain points around the map. And once that point is triggered and all the enemies around there are killed, they won't pop up there anymore. Which means you can clear an area of enemies and explore that area comfortably without worrying about more spawning. Now, as for the bosses, there are bosses that are in dungeons, and then there are the world bosses. The bosses are a real highlight because they're the way in which this being a Souls-like is most obvious. It's the place where you'll be using your pattern recognition and anticipating enemy attacks the most. You'll be dodging and iframing through attacks and taking advantage of openings whenever you find them. Most of the bosses are pretty good, but especially the ones situated at the end of levels. The world bosses are excellent, and like I said before, they're well suited to dealing with a full party of players. And there's more than one world boss. Each world has two stories, and depending on which story you end up doing, it'll have a different world boss at the end. In fact, there's some variation even if you're doing the same story. A few of the bosses will have you fight different versions of the same boss depending on the decisions that you make. And of course, each one of those different bosses have different loot that you can access, further adding to the game's replayability. Now, there are two bosses that are kind of an exception. These two bosses are gimmicky, and maybe even gimmicky to the extreme. 
I mention them now because they're not avoidable bosses, they're not optional, they are necessary to completing the game. And they're somewhat divisive in the community. So let me talk about them vaguely a little bit and give my thoughts. The first boss is just completely a gimmick. It's something of a puzzle boss. Its primary attacks will kill you in one hit, it will constantly kill you in one hit. It doesn't give you the ability to revive even if you're playing in co-op, even if you have perks that would normally let you revive. It is an instant one-hit kill. You will probably die several times just trying to figure out what to do, and then you'll die many more as you figure out the rules of the environment, as you come to fully comprehend the gimmick. And then after you do understand all the things that is going on with the boss, it'll still be difficult to actually do what you have to do. The end result is that a lot of people are going to be stuck on this boss for a while. Because it's not the kind of thing you can overcome by just getting, you know, better gear, different weapons, a different strategy. The strategy is simple. The strategy is obvious once you know it. But getting through it will require you to pay a price in time. You're going to spend time on this boss. And some people, I'm sure, are not going to like that. Now, the other contentious boss is the final boss. The final boss is hard. It is very hard. My first playthrough I played on Veteran Difficulty, which is the normal mode, and there was nothing normal about that boss. That thing is overwhelming. It has an incredible number of attacks, and they do so much damage. There's so much going on in the fight that you're teetering on the edge of sensory overload. I've seen several people in forums that just bounced off the boss, couldn't beat it, stopped playing it, and I know one person in real life that just stopped, couldn't beat it gave up on the boss, gave up on the game afterwards. And that's a person that's beaten all of the Souls games, including Sekiro. The final boss is bullshit, and it throws endless streams of bullshit at you. It's also incredible. It's one of the best bosses I've ever played. It's an amazing fight. It's so good. So good. All the things that, that people complain about are true. I totally understand the people that bounce off of this boss. I found it amazing. Because it's not just challenging, there's a lot of presentation to it. It's a boss with a lot of presence. It also has great music, and the music shifts depending on what's going on in the boss fight in a really good way. A really excellent way. I can't talk very much about it without spoiling it, which I won't do. But here's how I would describe the boss, for anybody that knows these references. It has the spectacle and presentation of Elden Beast from Elden Ring mixed in with Zant from Twilight Princess. So you take the atmospheres that those two games are trying to cultivate, mix them together, and then add in a lot of mechanical difficulty to that. And you'll get something approximating this boss. It was a very satisfying conclusion to this game. All right, let me talk about how the loot works in this game, because it's important and I've been neglecting it. When you start off, you don't have anything. And as you progress through the game, you'll find secrets, you'll clear dungeons, you'll find items on the ground. There's a lot of different types of loot for you to get. So, for example, there are weapon mods. Weapon mods are abilities that you can attach to specific guns. At the beginning, you'll have access to four, and there'll be simple things like imbuing your bullets with fire damage for the next 10 seconds. Or having healing charges that you can use without having to use up your relic. Once you use these up, you'll have to generate more mod power, which you do by damaging enemies. Different mods work in different ways, and some of them have multiple charges. Now, apart from the starter ones, you can't buy mods, you need to craft them. And the materials to craft them are found as loot. Either as loot from beating a boss or a mini-boss, or sometimes from solving a puzzle. Either way, weapon mods are very powerful. Sometimes they can change how you want to play. And so getting a new one is always worthwhile. The other primary loot source is rings and amulets. You can equip up to four rings and one amulet. Typically, rings will have minor but significant buffs, things like increased reload speed, more damage perhaps, damage to melee weapons, damage to ranged weapons, more damage when you hit a critical weak spot, more damage if you hit a weak spot multiple times, more mod power generation, or speed buffs under certain conditions. It can vary by a lot. Amulets are similar, they just do more. Their effects will be more significant than what you typically expect from rings, since you can only equip one amulet. Together, the rings and amulets combine to let you make your build. You collect them and use their effects to improve what you're already doing. It's always nice when you find one that augments the archetypes that you're already playing. Or you might find certain rings and amulets 
that augment a playstyle that you're not currently playing, but you might. You think that maybe it would work well with an archetype that you're not currently using, and maybe that encourages you to start using that archetype. In this way, pretty much anything that you pick up could be inherently useful. It has value even if it doesn't have value to what you're doing right now. There are also traits. Traits are attributes that you can level up. Things like added health, added stamina, added stamina regeneration, evade distance, mod power generation. There's a lot of different traits. You level them up by finding books of knowledge in the world, which is a loot item, or by defeating bosses. The game also lets you unlock new traits. You get the traits from completing different bosses, certain quests, and certain puzzles. Each archetype has an archetype exclusive trait as well. However, once you get that archetype to max level, level 10, you'll be able to use and level up that trait in any of your different archetypes, even if you're not using the one it was normally associated with. There are also different relics. Normally, your relic is what you use to heal. It starts off quite standard, but you can find across the world multiple different hearts that will heal you in different ways or won't heal you at all, and instead will grant some other benefit. Maybe they'll heal you slowly over time. Maybe they'll grant you a bunch of mod power. Maybe they'll grant a shield instead of healing for a certain amount of time. Or it will heal more per relic use, but also reduce the number of times you can use the relic. There is also mutators that can be attached to your guns and melee weapons. Some of these can be purchased in town, but also most of them need to be found. These have effects that will benefit certain types of weapons more, and should be placed on those weapons if you can get them. For example, there's one that gives increased ranged damage the closer the magazine is to being a full. This mutator benefits bows and weapons that only have one round in the chamber before they have to reload. Mutators can also be upgraded, and will have an added powerful effect when they're at max level. An example is Twisting Wounds that will do extra damage if the target is bleeding, and at max level will cause the target to bleed if you hit its weak point. The point I'm making is that there's a lot of different types of loot, a lot of different types of upgrading things, and many different abilities that can be combined together to make a really interesting build. For example, the one I mentioned that increases damage against bleeding targets can be paired with amulets and rings that also benefit from facing bleeding targets. An amulet that increases damage against bleeding targets, a ring that increases your health while near a bleeding target, maybe another ring that causes melee attacks to do bleeding damage, and maybe a special melee weapon that does the same thing, a mod that also makes bleeding... You can make a bleed build, you know, if you wanted to. You can take a look at all of the various different weapons, items, mods, and abilities that you have access to, and put them all together in a way that synergizes and that you came up with. It's a lot of fun. And it's one of the reasons that co-op remains interesting when you play with your friends. There's a big chance that playing in your friend's world will get you interesting loot that you may not have had access to before. And thankfully, in a recent update, the game introduced loadouts. So once you make a build that you're happy with, you can save it. Then if you choose to move on to another build, you can save that one as well and switch between them at no cost. The loadout will automatically equip what weapons you were using, what mods you were using on those weapons, what mutators were on those weapons, what relic you had equipped, and how you distributed your trait points. There is one problem with the loot and upgrade mechanic. First of all, the scaling of the world corresponds to your power level. At a higher power level, enemies will have more health and they will do more damage. Your power level is based on your two highest archetype levels and your highest upgraded weapons, which means that upgrading weapons also strengthens enemies. Now there's a few issues with this. First of all, it makes your unupgraded weapons a lot less powerful and disencourages you from using them because to really experiment with them properly, you'll need to upgrade them up to the level of your most upgraded weapons. Now that would be fine, but like I said before, the resources can be rather scarce, especially the money resource early on. Most of the starter guns are available from the beginning of the game, but you have to pay for them. And even buying just a few of them can be pricey. And then you have to spend the material and resource cost to upgrade them to a commensurate level to your highest upgraded weapons. Because of this, on my first playthrough, I decided I would save my scrap so I can use it on other things like unlocking archetypes, unlocking new weapons. And I'd only spend my resources to upgrade my weapons when I felt like I was falling off in damage. At the time, I didn't really know how the scaling worked. But that turned out to be a very good decision, because if you don't spend all your money upgrading your weapons, your power level will increase very slowly. 
at whatever rate you are increasing your archetypes. I kept all of my weapons at plus four, and at that level, it doesn't take very much money or resources to upgrade your weapons. This left me free to experiment with all the different things that I got, and I wouldn't waste valuable resources on weapons I would end up not using. And I recommend the same thing for first-time players. You shouldn't upgrade your weapon unless you're going up into a higher difficulty after you finish the game, or you just feel you're not doing enough damage. Finally, let's talk about the story, because I have conflicting feelings about it. In a way, I think the story is awful. I'm a story-oriented person. I need to care about what I'm doing to play even a game that focuses mainly on gameplay. And at many moments, this game did not do a good job with that. The introductory cutscene and the events leading up to you getting to the main hub was painfully bad. Those first 40 minutes before the game opens up to you had me convinced I was not going to get through this game. But surprisingly, I don't feel the same way about the individual world stories that you go through. Every world that you go to is going through some kind of apocalyptic event. Some drastic change is happening to their world, and they're trying to deal with it. And these areas have surprisingly high-quality world-building and writing, and some of them have some incredibly good set pieces and pacing. These individual world stories did a much better job of investing me in what's going on. I cared a lot more about what was happening. There are books that you can read that are surprisingly lengthy and Many of them managed to capture my attention. Even in co-op, there was a moment in co-op when I saw a book and I started reading it and got distracted. And then I thought to myself, well, I should probably go check up on my friend. I've been reading this book for like at least two minutes. He's probably wandered off. And so I get up from the book and I go over to my friend to see what he's doing. And he's found a different book in a different room nearby. And he's also reading that. So in all of these places, I found myself reading the books, listening to the audio logs, looking at the item descriptions of any new item, ring, weapon I get, and enjoying the general pacing of each world's developing revelations and story. But shockingly, the main story doesn't get any better from the beginning, at least not by much. Even all the way up to the end, anything related to the main story was embarrassingly bad. At the final battle area, there's a moment where you can ask more questions. The, the NPC will tell you, do you have any more questions before we head into the final battle? And I think it's the only time in the game where I just said, no, let's just, just do it. In every other NPC interaction, I have gone out of my way to exhaust every available dialogue option. Because I cared, because I was curious what they had to say. In the moment before the final battle, I realized, I don't want to hear this person tell me anything about this situation. So, I didn't like the main story, but the individual world stories, I think, were great. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is puzzles in Remnant 2. The developers seem perfectly comfortable with you not finding the secrets and you not getting the puzzles. They seem okay with huge swaths of the player base not figuring something out and having to look it up, or just ignoring it. They're comfortable even eager to make content that many people will not find organically. Because the ones that do find it organically, do solve the puzzle, do notice the secret, are going to feel great for having done that. They'll hide secrets even for their archetypes. These are big chunks of content. The archetypes are, are a major way of playing. And if you don't find them, they are perfectly okay with that. And these are not your run-of-the-mill normal secrets that you're going to find in your typical God of War game. Now, these are often hard. The puzzles are hard. The secrets are obscure. Some of them you're very unlikely to find on your own. But you'll probably find some of them. You'll figure out some of them, you'll intuit some of them, and you might accidentally happen upon some. What I found interesting about the puzzles and the secrets is that I ended up feeling a lot like how it was before the internet became such a prominent thing. As a rule, I don't look anything up when I'm playing a game for the first time. And so I might spend a lot of time trying to figure out a puzzle, or I might stumble on a secret and feel great any time one of those things happened. Anytime I figure something out, anytime I find a secret area that I think is a secret area, it's great. And because of this game's heavy emphasis on co-op, I would play with my friends, and they will have found and seen secrets in their own runs, maybe in different areas. And so we would often trade notes, hey, did you know about this secret here? As I'm going through the world, hey, did you figure this thing out here? Did you notice this? And that was a wonderful feeling. It really took me back to pre-internet video game times. 
Occasionally I would come across a puzzle that I couldn't figure out how to do, and then I'd invite my friend and say, hey, do you know this one? No, I don't know this one. Let me, let me try and look at it. And together we'd, we'd mess with the puzzle until we figured it out. From interviews I've seen with the developers, they aren't willing to compromise on the puzzles. They realize not all their players are going to like puzzles or secrets, but their attitude about it is kind of like, well, tough. That's the kind of game Remnant is. It's the kind of game Remnant is always going to be. If you don't like the complicated puzzles, then just ignore them, or look up the solution, or go play a different game. Obviously, they didn't say that I'm paraphrasing, but that's the attitude that they have towards this. This is the game they wanted to make, and they're not going to change it. Alright, final recap. This is a good game, it's a good Souls-like. There's a lot of room for expressing your build in interesting ways. The main story will be enjoyed by nobody with taste, but it's redeemed a lot by the side stories that are in every world. And now happens to be a very good time to get into the game because three DLCs have been announced. The first one is coming soon, about a week after this video releases. There have been a lot of good games this year and even a lot of high-profile Souls-likes. Yet even so, Remnant 2 is notable because it absolutely has the best implementation of co-op that any Souls-like has ever managed to produce. And that's the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching.